Hello. So in today's video, I want to discuss book covers. Now, for authors, this is a very big topic that a lot of people question a lot of different ways. And I want to give you my thoughts on book covers. Going with the research I've done, my own personal thoughts, what I've done with my own covers, and maybe some of this will give you guys ideas on how to deal with your own book covers. What to look for, what you want to buy, and what options are available to you. So let me start this with a disclaimer. As I talk about book covers, I know not everyone is the same. Not every person is going to fit the specific details that I'm discussing. You might be the exception to the rule. I will be discussing the mass majority of people. So please don't flood my comment section saying, you're wrong, you have no idea what you're talking about, because I'm not discussing certain individuals that I am sure exist out there in the world. I am talking about the mass majority. So let's begin. First off, I want to start by saying that book covers, yes, they used to be very important to buying. You had to have a very good book cover because we did not have things like social media, YouTube, the internet, or even TV. Over the centuries, since books have, were first created, things have changed. We got television and radio. People would often talk about books on the TV or on the radio the way they would talk about movies. Then we got social media, YouTube, and a lot more people began to talk about books. And the reason why book covers aren't really as relevant to the general population is because people do not go into a store to browse for books. They don't walk along the shelves looking for a book really to buy, and if they are going into a bookstore or into a store that has books, they usually go in with the intent of looking for a certain book to buy. Now, does that mean that if somebody's walking through the store and they see a really cool cover and they pick up the book, they won't buy it? It depends if they got the book they were looking for. It depends on if they have the money for it. There are a lot of factors that play into this. Yes, the cover art is part of that. Me, personally, let me share an experience I've had. I was looking for audiobooks. I have walked into the store. I've gone straight to the book section. I looked for the things I was looking for. Did not find it. I thought, hey, let me see what other stuff they have. But their audiobook section was very poor. They, There were some cool-looking covers, but the books were overpriced. And I was like, I don't know anything about this book. I don't even know if I'm going to like it. I don't even know if it's that good of a story. Yeah, the cover's nice and all, but, you know, I'm one of those people that I'm not going to be fooled by a nice cover. The original cover for Ready Player One was very plain, yet the story was insanely epic. It blew me away how good that story was. It was one of the best books I've read in years. And the cover was only okay. It wasn't spectacular. It wasn't, it didn't look like someone spent millions of dollars or Okay, realistically, a few hundred dollars to hire some all-time professional artist to do the cover. But it did not seem like a ton of money was really funneled into it. Yet, it's become a movie. It's become an audiobook. And 
the audiobook is narrated by Will Wheaton. And I love that story so much. I will fight tooth and nail and say yes. This is a perfect instance that can prove where the book is better than the movie. And I don't think a lot of readers would disagree with that. The reason why this has changed is because of the fact... Look at it like the way you look at a movie. When you want to go see a movie, you don't want to go see a movie just based on a poster. You want to watch the trailer. You want to see what early reviewers have to say about that movie. Books are kind of the same way. They're not just going to go and buy a book based off a cover anymore. They want to see what other people who have read it thought of it. They want to learn more about the story. Find out more details. Visit the website and check it out. See what the authors put into this. See what the story is kind of about. That's what people do. They do more research on the book or on the movie before the movies even come out. Sometimes they've actually discovered spoilers for the movies and ruined it for everyone else. Trailers nowadays for movies kind of give away the entire plot and it's like, okay, now you've just ruined the movie because you've shown the movie that is an hour and a half long in five minutes. And yeah, a lot of times, sometimes there's parts where that's done in a trailer for a movie and it looks like they revealed the twist, but there's still more of a twist to come at the very end of a movie. But you know what? Usually those twists are not that spectacular. I remember when Pet Cemetery came out, the new one, the remake, and... Everybody was upset because there was a spoiler in the trailer for the movie. And it's like, okay, well, of course you knew about this if you read the book. But they spoiled it in the trailer. It really didn't matter. Like, anything else that happened after really didn't matter. And that's what ruined the movie was too many people saw spoilers in the trailer. Same thing with Star Wars. And yes... That is what I attribute to the downfall of Star Wars, is before Rise of Skywalker came out, people got spoiled and ruined it by spoiling details, which they completely misunderstood. There were things that happened in the Rise of Skywalker, like people were all upset that Rey, by the way, spoiler if you haven't seen it, but if you haven't, and you want to be surprised, go watch it instead of listening to me talk about it, please. But Ray, at the end, goes back to Luke's farm. She buries Luke and Leia's lightsabers, and then she has that those words with that old woman. You know, back when Rise of Skywalker came out, people were saying, oh, she buries Luke's and Leia's lightsaber, then lives in Luke's old home. Um... No, that was nothing like what was going on at the end of that movie. She was there burying the only remnants of her teachers. Since their bodies both faded away, there was no physical bodies to bury. Alderaan was destroyed. Tatooine was about as close to an ancestral home that the two of them had. So yes, she went back to Tatooine found the Lars homestead, and buried the lightsabers there. Because that was the closest thing left for the Skywalkers that they could really call home. Luke and Leia, they never knew their mother. They didn't even know their father, really. So she would have no way of knowing that the next place that would be mostly home to the Skywalker family would have probably been Naboo. So, you can't really fault her for doing what she did. But this is not a Star Wars video. I'm just saying, people found this information out, ruined the end of Rise of Skywalker, and judged the movie before it was even released. So, when you are writing on the back of your cover, when you're writing the back cover, or you're writing the synopsis, 
That's another thing to keep in mind too. Do not give too much away. Do not say too much about your story because if you give something away, you could ruin the experience of actually reading the story. My book, I tell the, my book, I only say like what happens within the first three or four chapters. Even though you can kind of guess where it's going to lead, there are some things that happen that mm, kind of throw you off. Or I shouldn't say throw you off, kind of build more into the story. My covers, as you can see here, my covers are a little on the plainer side. But, see, I have what I'm I'm doing something what I call theming my covers. Each cover in my book series actually gets darker the further it goes on. Just like the story gets darker the further it goes on. On the cover of each book, I have an item. Or I have a thing that rep is representative of what's going on in the story. Here, I have this necklace. It's not anything special. Yes, jewelry has been put on covers before. But it's representative of this is Shane's key to the North Pole. This is how he gets in and out of the North Pole. This is one of the first things he's given upon his arrival. That's pivotal through the book series. Here in book two, this is a big shout out or a big hint at what you know should be coming in this book. I went through so many different types of covers thinking of how to fit something relevant that was fire and ice. And ultimately, I said, no, I don't need fire or ice. I need this thing. This is a pivotal part of this story. This fits this part of the story. Book three. This on the cover is something pivotal to this story. I could have put a sword since a large portion of it revolves around Excalibur, but I wanted to leave Excalibur to the imagination of my readers. But this, I didn't mind showing you what I envisioned for this item and what it is. And the same goes for every other book in the series. I chose each thing specifically tying it to the book cover that it's part of. But I don't sit there and assume that people are going to specifically buy my books based on the cover alone. They are probably more than likely going to buy my books because I promote I get good reviews for my story that I get reviews on not just Amazon but on YouTube that YouTubers are actually picking it up and saying wow I like this so much I need to do a YouTube video about it I need to let people know and that's the big thing that's where most of your sales are probably going to come from is word of mouth people telling a friend hey I just read this really good story you should check it out that's where most people they're like okay yeah or the second biggest is probably if your book is turned into a movie or a TV series. Because then people want to check out the book and yeah, that's when they decide which is better, the book or the movie. I have seen some covers with really great graphics done on them. There was a book, I don't remember the name of it. Back when I released book one, I was doing a lot of research into book covers. And there was a book somebody had where they ended up buying three copies of this book. And they were going to give one away. And if the video hadn't been six months old, I probably would have tried to get the book. Because the book cover actually looked really nice. And it was some sci-fi story. And maybe my readers, anybody who reads can attest to what book this is, because I can't remember the video I saw this in, but the book was rated to be one of the worst books ever written. Like I said, it's some sci-fi book by, I believe, a female or a female author, and it is supposedly one of the worst books ever written. And the guy who actually got it said that he ordered it on Amazon. There was a problem with his order, so he reordered it. And because he was talking about it with his wife, she saw it at a bookstore 
and I actually picked it up for him so he could review it for his YouTube channel. So he ended up with the three copies because the first order actually finally came right on the same day that the second, the reorder came. So that's how he ended up with all three. And then he was doing a giveaway. But like I said, since the since it was a six month old video, I was like, well, he probably gave those away a long time ago. Moving on to the next part of this, which is keep in mind that art is subjective. If you have a cover that looks like it was painted by Michelangelo, like the ceiling at the 16th chapel, you know, you could have a cover art like that and it could maybe fit, you know, your story. But if somebody's not really into that kind of art, they're not going to like the way your cover looks. And that's the biggest problem. I mean, you are never going to find a book cover that fits everybody's taste. If I had put, let's say, for example, with mine, if I had put anime characters on the cover of my book, if I hired somebody to draw up a anime style poster and gave them a free copy of what my book had so they could draw something that looked like my book and it was anime characters not everybody's into the anime art style so some people they might pick it up thinking it's going to be manga Others might pick it up just because it does look like a nice anime cover. They might be confused when they open it up and it's just a novel. I don't know if this has ever been done, but I mean, I asked a friend of mine who does read a lot of manga and he said that he would probably do some research. It depends on how nice he liked the cover because there's also different styles of anime art. So, again, you know, this is very subjective. Just because you like it doesn't mean a million other people are going to like the way the cover looks. Maybe there is. Maybe there's something. I don't know. But that's just my personal ideas is that you're never going to find an art style that everybody likes. Me, personally, I see a lot of book covers and I wonder what people were thinking. Sometimes I see book covers where the author's name is the biggest thing on the book cover. And I'm wondering, wow, this person, why does their name have to be so large? If it's a big name, like Stephen King, I can understand. But at the same time, it's a Stephen King book. He doesn't need to have his name sprawled all over the cover. In my personal opinion, growing up, most of the books I ever read... The title was the biggest thing on the cover. Usually the author's name was just a little bit at the bottom or in the corner or sometimes not even on the cover. So I don't understand why a lot of books put the author's name like directly in the center, huge lettering, and then you got the, at the bottom, you got the title of the book. Because I've been actually kind of confused, like, is this the author's name or is this the title of the book. I have a book on my shelf where the author's name takes up three-fourths of the spine and the last one-fourth of the spine is the title of the book. To me, that is ridiculous. But that's my personal preference. Maybe you like that. I don't know. But I'm not going to be sold on the spine or on the cover because I'm probably going to go check it out beforehand. Like, Recently, I checked out this new author. I don't know how new he's... I mean, looks like he's been doing stuff for like under 10 years. But Chris Colfer. And I'm really getting into his books. And I even plan to review that next month. Once I get all the cop... Once I get all the audiobooks in the mail, I'm going to be reviewing all of his books for his book series which is six books long. I like the way his animated style works for the covers. It reminds me a lot of a several other books that I'm a fan of. Harry Potter, series of unfortunate events. The animated style is kind of the same. So I checked into it and I actually thought, hey, this sounds very interesting. So that's why I picked it up. But I didn't pick it up just based on the cover alone. I picked it up because I researched what the story of the first book is about. And that's all I did. I didn't go beyond the first book. I listened to an audio, I listened to the first few chapters on YouTube as I found them. 
I found like the first few chapters on YouTube and I listened to it and I was like, oh, hey, yeah, this sounds really good. And surprisingly, it's read by the author. Now, me personally, I suck at reading out loud. I used to, if you can't tell in some of my videos, I used to actually read out loud from a script I tried to write up and it was not good. So I suck at reading out loud. You will probably never get to hear me read out loud any of my books. I'm sorry if you're into that, but not from me. You don't want to hear me trying to read my own books. I promise you. Can some authors do it, though? Yes, some can. Some can do it and do it well. Some have that really good voice. Me, I suffer from dyslexia. Yeah. Me, I suffer from dyslexia. So... I have trouble reading out loud. I have trouble reading sometimes, which is why I do need a proofreader when it comes to my own books, because I need to see if I caught all my mistakes. I use the computer as I type to read back to me, like, I'll get through a chapter, have it read it back to me. And then after I'm all done with the book, I go through it again, having the book read back to me with the computer voice just to double check, just to make sure I got everything. And then I finally send it off to a proofreader. After, of course, I run it through with Grammarly to make sure I didn't miss any commas, periods, exclamation points, question marks, or any kind of other marks that... I could have added. So, what was I talking about? Oh, yeah. Subjective art. Wow, that really went off topic. But you get my point. Everybody does things a different way. Everybody has a different style that they like. Everybody is not going to like the same thing. When I was actually researching my own book cover, which, yes, I did mainly design my own book covers, I asked around like 20 different people, what do they like to see on book covers? And I would list off things. The thing that all 20 people basically agreed on is they don't like to have people on the cover of books. They said it just, it does not look very good. It's very hard to come across a book that has a person on it that really fits the book or really makes the book work for them. And I can kind of understand what they're talking about. Because when I was growing up, my stepmother, she would read books all the time and Every single one of her books had similar looking characters on all the covers. It was like a Fabio guy and some like woman in a dress. I never picked up those books and read them, but she seemed to like them. So, I mean, that might have been an older style for older people. They like the people on the covers. But nowadays, most people don't like people on the covers. So it's very subjective to your reader. So make the best book cover you can. Do the best you can. Just when people sit there and tell you that, oh, you need to have a mind-blowing book cover, tell them where to shove it because that is not necessarily how the majority rates books. Do you know why book covers mattered so much in the past before the time of internet TV, radio, social media. That was because of the fact when people wanted entertainment, they had to go to bookstores. And they actually had to browse through the books. There wasn't a way to advertise what the book was about. Except flyers, street signs, posters. Those were the things that advertised the books. And usually it had a image of the book on it. What we put up nowadays for quick ads on whether it be our own personal sites or on tweets or on Facebook messages, those things used to be on store windows, on a cardboard sign sitting in front of the store door, in the libraries. Like I said, this does not necessarily apply to every single person that reads. Yes, there may be a reader out there who does go every week to a bookstore just to browse through the shelves to find their next book. But that's not everybody. Most people, they're going to know what they want to read. They're going to know what they want to pick up before they've even walked in the door, before they've even turned on their computer or gone to their 
favorite book website. They're going to have researched, whether it be on Goodreads, Amazon, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, they're going to check out what book is popular. And that's honestly where self-published authors, this is where we have the biggest, this is where we have the biggest problem selling books. Because unless you just happen to get lucky or you spend a ton of money selling book ads everywhere you can, it's hard for our voices to be heard over the professional, traditional published books. And like I said in a previous video, I have had a hard, hard time trying to find a book agent that will work with me as a self-published author, which is really mind-baffling because, you know, you would think that these big companies would be trying to pick us up and using the book agents to basically nab us while we're new within the first five years. Because if we can build a name for ourselves without the traditional book companies, then that would look bad for them because we would be serious competition and we wouldn't need them at that point. So they should be using book agents to go out and get them fresh talents because if a book, if a traditional book company came to you and offered you lots of money to work with them, you'd probably take it. Because you're new and you're being told, we want you on board. Here is money. Come work for us. Not realizing that you are now a, you look like you could be a possible threat. You've got a great, interesting new idea. Your book agent has seen what you can do. They know you're willing to put in the work. You care a lot about your story, but you're struggling, so you need money now. Here, let's get you with this traditional publisher so you're not a hindrance to them and you can make them money so they can pay the book agent. I think more book agents should be targeting self-published authors. And if a self-published author came to you, I really think you should consider really checking them out. And I think they should honestly ask for more than just a chapter. Most of the time when I've been filling out query letters, They've asked for like the first nine pages or the first chapter of my book. And it's like, yeah, you might want more than that. Because, yeah, the first chapter of my book is pretty big, pretty epic. Of my first book, of my first chapter, a lot of crap goes down. But that's not the entire story. There's a lot more to the story than just what you get in the first chapter. The first chapter is just a mere taste of what this story is going to bring you. And until you can actually digest and understand every part of the story, and I think a lot of writers would say this about their books, because that's how it we're taught to do. We're taught to bring you in with the first chapter, but the first chapter should leave you wanting more. So either they're not reading it or we're not doing good. And not getting any feedback is kind of a problem. I mean, yeah, go ahead and deny us. That's fine. But at least tell us why you're denying us. Directly tell us why we're being denied so we can work on it. Or maybe we just weren't for you. You know, that's fine. Tell us that too. But don't just say, sorry, we're not taking anyone right now. Keep you in mind. That's basically the response I got. And it's like, well, that just, to me, it comes off like they just don't want to work with a self-published author. Which really is, like I said, baffling. Because we're the perfect person you should be going for. We're the person that's going to probably be the easiest to deal with. Because we're going to be hit by that glamour and fame. Oh, this this person works with Netflix. I can get you a deal where your book could get turned into a Netflix series. Oh, wow. Really? Great. Let's do that. They want to pay you this much money. Okay, great. Let's do that. We're probably going to be very inclined. As you, yep, let's do it. Come on. Let's do it. I'm waiting. Let's go. Just make it happen. Get me in the door. We're not going to care. And they're going to try to push to get the most money because the more money we make, 
the more money they make. So this is why they should be trying their best to work with self-published authors. And this is why, going back to what I began with, why I say book covers, they don't necessarily make the book anymore. That is an outdated, in my opinion, this is an outdated thought process. People know what they want to buy before they even go to look at it. Think about the last book you read. Did you read it because you saw the book cover? Or did you see a movie? Or did somebody tell you about the book? I'm pretty sure it's somewhere in one of those three categories. And two of those do not involve the cover. But those three are the possibilities. Because you either saw the cover... Or you had a friend or so someone on social media that, like, Goodreads or whatever said, Hey, go check out this book. I just finished it. It was awesome. Or they saw a review on YouTube or something. Another problem, by the way, before I finish up here that I want to address that I have with covers is... Not only sometimes is the author's name big, bold print right in the middle of the book cover, but there's also sometimes where I see book covers that just has way too much going on. Stickers and bestsellers font at the top. Number one New York Times bestseller. It's like, wait a minute, this book doesn't look like it came out too long ago. How do they already know this is going to be... New York Times bestseller. Sometimes there's actually other texts, like taglines, like, you know, something you'd see on posters or something. It's like, why are you putting a tagline that has nothing to do with the title on the cover? That's what the back of the book is for. Keep all that stuff on the back of the book. Don't be covering up the person spent money to buy that art or to have that art made for them. Or... If they are very savvy with, you know, art themselves, maybe they drew that art. Why would you want to cover it up? Look at the first editions of Harry Potter. It just had the picture of Harry Potter, what was like a scene from the book, and Harry Potter, and the Sorcerer's Stone, and down at the bottom, J.K. Rowling. And if you had any kind of sticker on it, it was that little t thin red box that said Scholastic. I don't recall there being much else on the covers of the Harry Potter books. You don't need more than that. Let your cover, if you're going to rely on your cover, rely on your cover. Don't be covering it up with a ton of other stuff. I don't know why anybody would ever want to do that. But again, art is subjective and book covers are a form of art so maybe i may not like it but you know joe schmo next door might your next door neighbor might think that's the coolest thing ever i don't know why they would think that but to each their own and you don't have to listen to any of my advice you can do whatever you want it's your book cover they say authors should never make their own book covers why not who knows our story better than we do when i chose this for the guardian of light when i designed my own cover i saw a rising trend in these item covers where some item was on the cover but one thing i noticed is that that was it there was just the item in a plainish background or a you know shadowy background or a foggy background there wasn't anything special other than the main item on the cover and it was set on like a deep purple but i wanted to do some something more. I wanted to do something that really connected the stories. So beyond just the titles, you knew this is where it was in the series. So I started with a bright white and I increased the shades of darkness through the book series, which represents how dark the story is getting, how deep into the story you are. So when you pick up a copy of my book. Yes, the first book is very lighthearted. It's very bright for a cover, but that means the story is very light. It's not going to be as dark as book four, but I'm not going to say why book four is so dark. But yeah, trust me, book four is pretty dark. Book three is kind of dark. Book two is a little dark. Book one's not that dark. So if you 
have the chance and you want to check out and see how I did this and why I did this and what I mean by the story gets darker, seriously, go to Amazon, check out my book series today. But here, you don't have to take my word for it. I'll let my friends explain it. Looking for something to pass the time? Need something good to read? and want something epic to get you ready for Christmas? Then check out his amazing paperback series on Amazon, The Guardian of Light, by the wonderful self-published author, Sean Connaughton. It is an epic saga, which will make any reader feel young again. This adult fantasy series was inspired by the works of J.K. Rowling, Stephen King, and H.P. Lovecraft. Now, Sean is very hush-hush on this. But what we can tell you is, it has fairies. Goblins, toys, love, adventure, trolls, magic, thrills, elves, elementals, chills, the Illuminati, magic, gods, gods Atlantis, wizards, wizards, a snowman, dwarves, dwarves and even Sant... Uh, oops. Can't say that. But seriously, check it out. This is a fantasy series that takes place in our world today and reinvents Christmas as we know it. So what are you waiting for? Go to Amazon.com and check out his paperback series, The Guardian of Light. So, in closing, I just want to say thank you for watching. I really hope that talking about this topic can help some writers out. I'm not saying that everybody has to make their own cover. I'm not saying every cover has to be the same or every cover has to be different. I'm saying decide what works best for you. Do what you think will work best for your story. Make your cover special in your own way. Work really closely with the artist. If I had my own, if I had my way, with what I wanted for my first book cover, it would have been completely different than what I got. But I couldn't afford. Every time I asked somebody who was an artist if they would draw me something, they wanted to charge me a lot more than I could afford to pay. Yes, you can find people out there on Fiverr or on other websites that will do it cheap. But, you know, ask for samples. Tell them what your story is about and ask for a sample. See what they're going to charge. Honestly, if they aren't even willing to read your book, how can they provide you with the best cover? If they're not willing to get on the phone with you or do a live chat with you, or listen to you go on about your book and what you want for the cover or what the story is about. They don't even have to really read it. They could just have you tell them what the story is about so you they can get a really good idea. Maybe that is done. I don't know because I haven't gone through a company that does book covers. I did my own. Like I said, I had a friend help me with my first book cover and it was okay, but it wasn't great. And I knew right away it was not great. It wasn't what this book series needed. It needed something else. But thanks to her help, I was able to quickly learn and adapt what she taught me into making my own book cover. And that's where I ended up with these. So, I want to thank everybody for watching. I hope this has been helpful and informative. I look forward to seeing your comments below. You can tell me if you agree with me, if you disagree with me, if you think I'm crazy, I'd love to hear your comments. If you are not subscribed to this channel, please, please subscribe today. And also make sure you ring the notification bell. I am on also, I am also on Facebook and Twitter. So, if you want to talk to me or join me there, I'd love to have more conversations with you. And if you have an idea for a future video, that you, something you want me to address, I'd be willing to talk about it. Put it in the comments below. I'm doing a lot more audiobook reviews now, so that's going to be picking up here over the next few months. I'll probably be doing a lot more audiobook reviews on this channel. If you are an author and you want your book that turned into... If you are an author and you have an audiobook that you would like to have me review, please, please visit my website. Go to my email. Shoot me an email asking me if I'd be willing to review it. Right now, I'm pretty much taking... 
mostly anything except straight up just plain dramas because I'm not really a big drama person and I don't want to have to give out a two three star review because it was just all drama and I it lost me so I'm telling you right now dramas straight up love stories that is not very interesting is probably not going to be my cup of tea but mysteries horror sci-fi action fantasy any one of those things yes i am very into that stuff and i would love to hear your audiobook so follow me on facebook twitter and shoot me an email if you want your audiobook reviewed on this channel i want to thank everybody for watching and happy writing